So, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I hope everybody's awake after lunch. You're not just settling down for a bit of a snooze after that uh, carb hit. Um, so, I'll give you a first a little Slido challenge. Um, you've got to see how many uh, themes from this morning you can pick out in my presentation. Uh, I can tell you there's a few, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how many you get. Okay, so first, who are Romberg Sursa? Um, we're known um, for big machines that do clever things. Uh, there's a couple of MFS pluses there, which we've got in the UK as well. This is a machine operating in Switzerland. Um, you can tell from the name Romberg and Sursa, we're, we're a combination of Austrian and, and Swiss businesses. Uh, and we have a, a business in the UK that's, that's uh, bringing their technologies and their ethos to our industry. Um, we're also known for, for slab track construction, um, both new build. Here's an example that's going on at the moment in Germany. Um, and uh, building over 40 kilometres of slab track right at the moment, um, connecting the airport to the centre of Stuttgart. We also do refurbishment work. Uh, here's an example in Switzerland, um, refurbishing uh, in the Heitersberg tunnel. Uh, we've also done quite a lot of refurbishment work in the UK on slab track systems. Um, as, as some of the systems that were installed as late as uh, ago as the, as the 70s are uh, now coming to kind of end of life. Um, as this is an S&C seminar, just a real focus on other things we do around the, around the place on S&C, um, we do maintenance, we do refurbishment, we do uh, renewals, um, and of course we do new, new construction. So um, we cover quite a lot of uh, aspects um, relevant to, to this. Um, but my talk today um, is about Barking Riverside. So um, how do we get videos to run? Can I just ask that? Should they, should they work automatically? Or oh, somebody's doing it for me. There we go. So um, the precast s and that I'm going to talk about was installed on Barking Riverside. So here's a little video that, that explains the project a little bit. So it's a one and a half kilometre long viaduct extension which takes the track from the line out of Barking to a new station uh, by the river called Barking Riverside, good naming. Um, there's a lot of new properties, new build around that. That's why the extension's been built, is to service the, the new population there. And that scissors crossover there is the focus of my talk. So the client in the first place envisaged a precast slab track approach for the viaduct um, and wanted the S&C to be in the same track form. Um, but that presented a few challenges. So, first, why precast? Well, there are a number of reasons why. I won't labour the point particularly, but minimising the weight on the structure, the quality that you can get with it, um, the reduced requirement for, for wet concrete on site, um, some of the other benefits improved working in, in sort of uh, wet and cold weather when, when you've got your wet concrete is actually covered by the precast. There's a number of benefits over trying to do a slab track all in in situ concrete. Um, the project also had some tight radii, slab track enables continuous welded rail, there were properties either side of the line. So there were a number of reasons why both slab track and pre-car slab track was the client's preference. For the S&C, however, um, that would be new to the UK. So um, not new to the rest of the world. The rest of the world uh, has seen a number of examples of pre-car slab track. Um, the picture above is an installation in Germany. Uh, which I uh, took a delegation from TFL um, and the designers Arcadis uh, at the time to, to go and visit, uh, to see what it would look like potentially. Um, however, all the components you see there aren't necessarily available here. So, great concept, but how do you actually put it together? Um, so, the key challenges we identified from that was, um, number one, points operating equipment. Um, I've used the acronym POE, hopefully that's... Uh, uh, comprehensible. Um, the plate work, so individual base plates that support the rail, um, and then in the specific circumstances we had uh, interfaces both with the viaduct um, and with the with all the, the steel work, the, the, the rails on top. So we had to make sure all the different parts were compatible. Um, so some of those parts would need product acceptance because they were going to be newly introduced, um, and some of them um, yeah, well, all of them you have to consider as a system. So you've got to do everything on its own, plus you've got to do everything together. So that was a pretty key requirement. 
Another complication is Transport for London were the sponsor, yet Network Rail would be the end owner, Network Rail standards. So therefore, it was the Network Rail's track authority who had to, to take that on. So the first question is, you know, beyond that is, how are you going to get that to work? So a few words, therefore, to the acceptance process, which was absolutely fundamental for this to work. So this seminar is called from, from manufacture to maintain, but there's an awful lot of engineering and planning and thinking that has to go on before you do that manufacturing phase. And an acceptance process, especially when you're trying to do something slightly new or slightly different, um, is, is really key. Um, and what's key is that everybody's bought into it um, and everybody's pulling in the same direction. Because if, if one part is not acceptable, then the whole thing um, doesn't work. So you can imagine um, my delight when our proposed solution for the POE, um, we got the message from Network Rail that, that not only did they want it, um, they were going to encourage us to propose it because they'd wanted to approve it for some time and hadn't had the time to do so. So that was, that was great. So... The, the process actually began upstream of the main contract to, to do the design and build of the, of the track on the viaduct. Um, because we'd, we'd seen the project coming, the client had been talking to, to um, the designer, um, and we were therefore looking out for the supply chain as, as to what, what could be put together. Um, and we therefore identified uh, a number of ways to make this feasible. Um, in terms of the plate work, there were various feasible options. In terms of the, the POE, what we identified was that whilst there were some options, there was only one that would potentially have the, the best chance to be achieved in time, and that was the Unistar HR. And I won't go into too much detail on that because you had a good presentation this morning, so you, you kind of have an impression already of what it, what it does. However, what it does for, for us and in this circumstance and for slab track is that when you have a slab track that's precast, you have individual base plates supporting the rail and not bearers. And that means that the rail moves separate to the slab, and that means that the POE has to have a tolerance to that movement. And if you go and ask a, a, a POE supplier who's used to supplying equipment that sits on a, on a bearer, they're not very happy when you, when you say that the rails are going to move separate to that bearer or that support. So it was it was very good to hear that, that the Unistar HR had in its fundamental concept that it could deal with that scenario. And they were comfortable and happy and had done it before. So um, when we proposed it then to Network Rail and they were looking at it for ballasted track uh, purposes, um, everything came together and, and um, the, the technical authority with the S&C team, Colin Durans and, and co, um, at Network Rail were very happy to, to assist that side of it. So they ran various workshops uh, for, for risk and identifying all the parts together. Um, and that was really looking at the whole system, both the POE and, and how the slab track would be different to um, uh, previous scenarios where they've used slab track and, and indeed ballasted track. So we did matrices of you know, what's different, what's changed. And what was good with this scenario is pretty much everything we looked at, the risks was re were reduced and then the situation was improved because everything was basically state-of-the-art. Um, the base plate system selected was the one from Schwiag, and there'll be some details of that in a minute. Um, and the precast system, if you hadn't already figured it out from the, the images, is the poor STA track system. Um, and just a little mention of all of them. You've seen a little, few mentions of this before, but this is the actual installation at Barking Riverside of the Unistar HR. Uh, fitting between the rails, um, the, the, the um, power pack is um, away. I think you said it could be 20 metres away. It's not that far, but it's, it's in a nice, convenient, accessible space from the, from the safe walkway. Um, the equipment on the track obviously has to be where it is. Um, as I mentioned, it can be used for ballasted track as well, so that was, that's, that's obviously a positive. You want something that can be used uh, in a variety of circumstances. Um, and... The, the key point really was to be able to integrate it with the design, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, so elastic rail supports, the base plates. So these were new to the market. Um, the base concept had already been developed, but use for the full suite of, of our vertical S&C components um, meant bringing together two things. Firstly, the top plate system is essentially the same as what you'd see on most modern S&C from... Uh, in this case, uh, with S-scale type fastenings. 
So most of that is very familiar to the maintainer. Um, what's less familiar, but is, is less need for maintaining, is the plastic base plate, which is a modular unit that can adapt to all the different lengths required, um, that sits underneath it and is cast into the, the track slab. Um, and in this case, it could be cast in a factory into the track slab, or it could be cast on site. Uh, in this case, we provided pockets in the precast slab to enable those to be positioned. I'll come on to exactly how that worked um, in the coming slides. But, uh, so the layout design was the first step, really. So um, everything in 3D modelling. Um, I think there was mentioned that the S&C can now be modelled in 3D. Um, would be really good to see that happening because that was the gap. You can see the rails on the plane line. Um, you can see the POE, even in the 3D model, you can see the precast slabs, but you can, what you can't see um, is the rails in, in the uh, scissors crossover. Um, but, but the real key for us was getting this layout as efficient as possible. So when you're using precast slabs for plane line, you can have an awful lot of commonality. So a lot of slabs the same, same length, same shape. When you've got S&C, you've got an awful lot of bespoke slabs, potentially. Um, and here, although we have some symmetry, if you've got all those fastening points fixed in a factory, um, there's, there's, there's more kind of individual slab geometries. So the approach we adopted was to, to try and create more commonality uh, and more, um, um, more slabs out of same mould was the principle. Uh, and we managed to do that by use of a, what we called a pocket system. So the precast slabs all have um, pockets in them to take the plate, plate work, and that allows a certain amount of tolerance. The tolerance is, is not just in the vertical direction, but also in the XY directions. And that means that we could create some additional symmetry because of the, the, the lack of perfect symmetry between left and right rails and front and back of the, of the layout. Um, and that made the production a little bit more efficient. So the, the design and the modeling of those slabs had to, to also prepare to take the, the POE. There's a close up from the model um, showing how it, how it would fit. Because the plate work is also adjustable in position, final position relative to the precast slab, um, shouldn't be too much as you'll see from the construction method. Um, but that meant that the POE also needs to be able to be shimmed or adjusted to its final position according to the rails. POE gets fitted after the rails are, are, are fixed. Um, and the system that was developed by First Alpine allowed that to happen. Um, so it was good to be able to have their model imported into our model to show how it would all, uh, would all work. And, and all this information was pulled together as part of the acceptance package of the whole system. So important to have uh, people all pulling in the same direction. Um, the base plate design, I think you see a little bit more detail here. So it's a couple of different examples of, of plate work required. There you can see a, um, the pocket uh, in a 3D shape, and here you can see the outline of the pocket in the precast slab. Um, and essentially the plate can be uh, raised or lowered according to fine adjustment, um, and also left, right, and forward and back. Um, and that's it's a, it's a way of adjusting for any final tolerances you may have in the system. And bear in mind, um, this was a first off. Um, it was also on a viaduct. So when you put things on a viaduct, things can move. So the ability to adjust was one of the key things we had in mind throughout the whole process. So you know, what if this doesn't quite work? Do you still have adjustment? Uh, is it possible to, to get it right on site? Um, the height above the slab is basically very similar to the, to the plane line, allows welding and, and attachments to the rails as necessary. Um, and you'll see in the pictures ahead, the pockets themselves were, were to be filled with a grout to fix the base plates, uh, and they were fitted with, a, with an exposed aggregate finish. Okay. So here we've got a video which should play uh, imminently, I think, if uh, assistants can click the button. And this shows the sequence of construction um, from, as it runs, So this is a um, elapsed time video. There we go. So this is how we took over the viaduct. There's some starter bars on the viaduct surface. Um, some reinforcement is required in the in the gap between the precast slabs and the bridge deck. 
Um, the bridge deck was draining longitudinally, which meant there was an uneven depth of concrete underneath. Then the precast slabs were positioned, the rails positioned on top, shuttering being installed and imminently some concrete will be poured to fix the slabs. I'll describe this in a little bit more detail in a moment. And once that's tidied up, we did a final check on the track alignment before pouring the grout to fix the rails. So, there we go, nice view at night to finish with. So, it looks nice and easy, doesn't it? But the reality is you don't get to that without an awful lot of preparation and planning. So I've done some of the, the description of the things that went into to getting ready for that. Um, and that all went in parallel with, with a Form B um, and, uh, and design approval process. Um, once we got to site, of course, when you're doing something for the first time, it's important to get people together and uh, train them. Um, and as was mentioned for the, for the Unistar and the other POE that, that, that are being introduced uh, now, this was the first time a lot of the site staff had seen this. Uh, some of our technical staff who were with us throughout um, were able to help and guide. Um, so you can see the precast slabs here being laid out on the ground beside the viaduct as part of a training exercise and a practice exercise. Um, and you can see the base plates being assembled. Um, key to note here, of, of course, th these are elastic elements um, actually supplied by Getzner. And um, the design was such from Shriag to, to ensure that the, the rail support stiffness um, and what the wheel sees is as even as possible throughout the layout, despite the fact that the base plates are a different size. Um, these elastic pads have differing uh, um, sizes and therefore you've got to configure either thickness, density or, or shape in order to make sure that the, the stiffness value um, that, the, that the track provides uh, is as even as possible. Um, so that was pretty key. But we also practiced with the pieces of rail as well. Um, here's a crossing panel. Um, and it was all about just before we actually went up on the viaduct and were doing it for the first time, everybody got a chance to, to have a go. Um, so the process in, in a little bit uh, slower than that video, um, the precast slabs were brought in by crane, in this case we could just have a, a crane beside the viaduct, um, positioning them um, firstly just with the crane and then we had various other devices to enable us to position them um, with spindles you can see adjusting the vertical. Um, once they were readied, you can see the whole layout there with all the pockets, the slabs are now pretty much on a plane. Um, then the plate work was as assembled, um, all being built up there. Once they were in place, um, and there was a few numbers, I guess, worth pointing out, 486 of them in total across the 32 slabs. Um, um, they were all built up as they were with, with uh, a, a modular approach. So each, each slab had a couple of pallets. All the parts for, the, for each slab are in each pallet. Um, provided from Shrihag, and then the, um, the switch and crossing panels were brought in and, and dropped onto timber um, chocks to start with. Okay, once they were in position and, and assembled, um, our fine alignment system takes over. So we've got a system called ROSAS. Um, this is one of its components here. Um, you can see with the little um, spindles uh, holding level, they can be, be used as part of adjusting the, the rails to its uh, final position, uh, vertically and laterally. Um, wasn't quite in the right place that, that was before we started lowering it because the, the base plates are well above the pockets there. So once it took the load and we, we could drop it down, we got the, the track in, into a, a good position. So that was like the first fine alignment position. However, we were concerned that there could be settlement of the, the, of the viaduct deck once we poured the concrete to fix the slabs. So that was the beauty of having a two-step process in this case, was that if, if there was any deflection of the bridge deck with the weight of the concrete being poured, then we still had a chance to do a final uh, adjustment. Um, shout out to the team, um, the, uh, the guys doing it, positioning it and, and getting all the parts in place um, in the summer of 2021. Um, there the, there's the shutters being prepared. Um, and put in place um, and the concrete's now been poured 
if you can see the, the white sections are the shear keys uh, filled. Uh, it gets a lot tidier at that point, and you can just focus on the rails and a final check. Um, and then finally the grout gets poured to fix the base plates, and there, there they are fixed, and it's ready for, for the next step of, of the installation. So um, eventually on the project um, we had um, the OLE being installed, and we had the, the POE installed. Uh, here's a team being trained on it, I believe. Um, and I think you can see there and there are the power packs for the, for, the, for the switch drives. So there's a safe walkway behind that wall, which is a derailment curb, which means that, that maintenance staff can actually access at least part of the system without, um, without a problem of um, getting on the track and, and being in a place of danger. Other than that, it's, it's a very tidy layout, easy to access and, and um, good for uh, inspection and, and any maintenance ever required. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, there were some challenges. It didn't all go perfectly smoothly. Um, it's a construction project after all. Um, there, were, there were some late changes to some of the layouts which, which required a quick adaptation within various uh, other parts of the manufacture, base plates and, and precast labs. There was also a, a rather strange um, discrepancy between the 1 in 50 and the alignment form B. The latter was slightly in error but had been signed off several years before and nobody actually double checked where some of the uh, important dimensions were. Um, and, but we were able, with the design configuration we had, to do a, a slight tweak on site and make sure that um, the geometry fitted. Um, and some lessons. Um, 3D modelling is great, but you do need to have all the parts. Um, an interesting question for bridge engineers, what temperature is your 3D model at? Um, because bridge decks get longer and shorter, uh, and that did affect some of the, some of the planning. Um, they also are different from when they're unloaded to when they're loaded. So again, what is the load state of your model? Uh, I think uh, Jan mentioned physics modeling. Well, actually some of the, some of the 3D models in BIM might, might benefit from some of that. Um, and of course, you know, with lessons from this, I think if you were doing it again, you might do a bit more pre-build so that some of the stuff on site would be quicker. In this case, we were able to take the program of the actual SNC construction off the critical path, which was able to sort of protect our, uh, um, our work in this case. But uh, I think final slide really here, uh, just to say some thanks. Um, a special shout out to Dave Mansfield, who was our client and sponsor and, and driving force behind some of the key decisions. Um, Colin Durans from Network Rail, um, Paul Lindsley from Schwerg at the time, now with Paul, um, and Chris Hardwick, who was basically a key guy all the way through the design phase and into the construction. And I think uh, one of his site engineers is here as well today, uh, Piero. So thank you very much for those guys. And there, I'll give you a final image of, of a, a neat job um, with thanks to the whole team. Uh, job well done. Thank you very much. <laughs>